In this lab, we're chaining together three vulnerabilities to poison the front-end cache. We'll exploit a parameter pollution vulnerability, and we'll hide our polluted parameter from the front-end cache within an unkeyed parameter by exploiting a parameter cloaking vulnerability. And that cloaking vulnerability exists because the front-end cache parses the query parameter separators differently from the backend application itself. So let's see what that looks like in Burp. So I'm going to go to proxy and HTTP history. And we want the request for geolocate.js here. So I'm going to send that to repeater and switch to repeater. I'm going to send a request because the first question we want answered is, is this geolocate.js endpoint a cache oracle? And we can see that it is because we can see three caching related headers that is giving away caching related information. We can see that we have a cache hit, that the age of the cached response is 21 seconds, and that the cached response will expire in 14 seconds when it reaches the max age. So this endpoint is a cache oracle, and we can continue to use it for our probing. Now let's also have a look if we can add a cache buster so we can separate our work from real live end users so we don't impact them, and that we can also invalidate the cache response whenever we want when we're trying to inject new payloads. So we can add one in the query string, and that's what we usually do. I'm going to start with that. So I'm just going to add a query parameter CB, and then I'm going to say cache buster for some random value and send a request again, we get a cache miss. If I send a request one more time, we get a cache hit. If I make a modification to the cache buster here and send a request again, we get a cache miss again. So that confirms that we can use the query string as a cache buster. But for this lab, I don't really want to do that. And the reason is we'll be fiddling with the query string here throughout the lab. And I kind of want to keep a clear separation um, between the query string and our cache buster. So I'm going to delete this. And instead, I'm going to try and use an alternative cache buster in one of the request headers. One good option here that I found for the lab is the origin request header. So I'm just going to say cache buster, some random values, dot example.com, and then send a request. And we can see that we get a cache miss. If I send a request again, we get a cache hit. And if I make a modification to the origin header here, then we can see that we get a cache miss again. So that means that we can use the origin header as a cache buster as well. And that kind of keeps the query string here clean uh, from any uh, added cache busters, just easier to work that way. The origin header is not the only one that you could try. There's also, you could also try adding a cookie header, an accept header, or you can try adding something to the accept encoding header. So we have the accept encoding header here, we have the accept header here, and then a cookie header is already here. So you can just try adding something else behind here if, you, if you'd like to. But for the purpose of this lab, I found that the origin header will do for the cache buster. So now that we have our cache buster, let's have a look at the request itself. So we can see that we have set country cookie here as the value for the callback query parameter. And we can also see that it's reflected that value within the response. So that gives us an easy way to do XSS because we can just change this into, let's say, alert one and then send the request, you can see that the cache is missed immediately. And that's because remember, the callback query parameter, the entire query string is part of the cache key. So that means that the cache is invalidated if we make any modifications here. But we can we can see that alert one is reflected in the response now. So that means that we we do have XSS. But because that qu callback query parameter is part of the cache key, that only gives us XSS for any requests from live end users that are actually issuing a callback query parameter for a value of alert one, which realistically will never happen. So we don't have a great exploit at the moment. But as a first step, let's try and see if we can do parameter pollution. So I'm going to set this back to what it was before. So I'm going to copy set country cookie here, and then paste it as the value for the original callback query parameter. And then we're going to add a second callback query parameter. And this is where we're doing parameter pollution. And I'm going to set it to our XSS that we did before and send a request. And remember, we get a cache miss again because this is all part of the cache key. And we can see that the parameter pollution is successful because the backend application is preferring the or is giving precedence to the second declaration here of the callback query parameter. So we have parameter pollution. But now we need to find a way to hide or cloak this second polluted callback query parameter from the front end caching server. And for that, we need to find an unkeyed input. And we can find that unkeyed input using Paraminer. So I'm going to right click and go to extensions, Paraminer, guest params, and then guest get parameters. And we can leave the default options and just click OK. 
I'm going to click Cancel, though, because I already ran the scan because it can take quite a while to finish. Now, both for the Professional Edition and the Community Edition, the results for the scan are available under Extensions. In the Professional Edition, they're also available under Target. But because the Extensions uh, way works for both the Community Edition and Professional Edition, I'll show Extensions uh, in this tutorial. So if I go to Extensions, then we need to select Paraminer here as our extension, and then go to the Output tab. And we can see that the scan has finished, and we can see that Paraminer identified UTM content as a unkeyed input. So I'm going to copy UTM content and go back to Repeater. And then I'm going to inject UTM content in between our original callback query parameter and our polluted one. So I'm going to put that there and then give it a value of foo. And then I'm going to add a ampersand to separate UTM content from the polluted callback query parameter. And then I'm going to send that request. And we get back a cache miss. That's normal. If I send a request again, we get a cache hit. But we can still see, more importantly, that we still have the parameter pollution working because we can still see alert one in the response here. If I make a modification to UTM content and send a request again, we still get a cache hit because UTM content was found as an unkeyed input. But if I make a modification to the polluted callback query parameter, then we get a cache miss. And that's not what we want, because we want the front end caching server to think that our polluted callback query parameter here is part of UTM content. So we want to basically hide this callback query parameter, this pollution one, within UTM content. And for that, we need parameter cloaking. And all we need to do for that is turn this ampersand here into a semicolon instead. And what we're hoping for is that there's a difference in the query string parsing behavior between the front end cache and the back end application. Because if the front end cache only sees ampersand as a valid separator, then it will think that our callback equals alert two here is actually part of UTM content. And you can see that Burp sees that like that as well, because this is all green, it's all part of UTM content. While if the back end is running a web framework like Ruby on Rails, which accepts the semicolon as a valid separator, then the backend application will still see UTM content and callback equals alert two as two separate query parameters. So let's give that payload a go. I'm going to send it. And then we can see that we get a cache miss. I'm going to send a request again, and we get a cache hit. And more importantly, we can see that we had a value of alert two here for our polluted callback parameter. And we can still see that reflected in the cached response here. So that means that the backend application is seeing the semicolon here as a valid separator for parameters within the query string. But if we make a modification to the alert2 payload here, and let's change it to alert3 and send the request again, we still get a cache hit. And that's exactly what we want, because that means that from the perspective of the front end server, it is seeing all of this. It's not seeing the semicolon as a valid separator. So it's seeing all of this as part of UTM content, which is an unkeyed input. So it's not part of the cache key. So the only thing that is in the cache key for the front end cache is callback equals set country cookie for geolocate.js. And that is exactly what live end users are requesting. So that means that this payload is successful in poisoning the cache. And all we need to do now to solve the lab is remove the cache buster here. And then we need to switch alert three to alert one, and then send a request. And we get a cache hit. That's probably because the lab victim is browsing the homepage or the lab in the background. So we just need to wait until this cache expires, until it hits 35 seconds, and then make sure that we send our payload a bunch of times to make sure that it gets the response to it gets cached by the caching server. And we get a cache hit, and we see that alert one is injected now. So let's switch to the lab. And we can already see, congratulations, you solved the lab. I hope this was helpful to you, and thank you for watching.